Okay, okay we're, gonna, we're gonna try this again. <laughs> we're back. We are back. Well, let's hope this lasts. You would think that uh, the technology would work, but anyways, mm -hmm. it is now 7:09 p.m. Eastern Time on January the 16th, 2018. This is the webinar about uh, safety bumpers and game elements. And today we have with us George Chisholm, first senior mentor who is in Oakville and also uh, mentor for Team 1360 Orbit Robotics out of a community-based team out of um, Oakville. Um, once again, if you do have any questions, we go through this. Uh, please do not hesitate to put them in the questions panel. Um, and we will get to them as we go along. Hopefully, we'll have lots of questions. In any case, um, let's since we're a little bit delayed getting started, let's get going right away. Um, just a word uh, about the 2018 First Safety Quiz. It's going to open tonight after the webinar. Actually, I started it a few minutes ago while my internet was working. Um, there's going to be a contest each day of the week for uh, first Canada hoodies. So we will draw one name each day from those students that have gotten uh, a pass, which is 100% on 30 random questions taken from the 120 some odd questions that we have in the safety quiz. Um, each day we'll figure out who are the uh, ones that got 100% and we'll pick a random number and that person will be awarded a First Canada hoodie. You can play as many times as you want, but uh, you'll only get one entry for that day, but you're welcome to play again the next day. And if you do get 100%, you will have earned a First Canada Bronze Safety Badge. Now, we did have this quiz last year. Uh, it's a slightly different one because this manual is slightly different. And if you had earned your Bronze Safety Badge last year, you do not need to um, take the quiz again, but you could because you could win uh, a hoodie and you may want to keep your safety skills sharp. In addition to that, um, we will be releasing information about the silver safety badge. And uh, in order to get to that one, and we'll release what the qualifications are for that, the criteria, you have to have a bronze safety badge. So um, I will post the uh, link on the First Canada uh, Facebook page uh, right after this webinar tonight. So, um, hopefully you have decided on a perimeter for your robot. And once you do, it is highly recommended that um, you start on your bumpers. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons that George is on is that he has a, there's an interesting story about the very first Calgary, um, Western Canada, um, regional in 2013 uh, that deals with bumpers. So maybe, um, George, you can explain what happened in 2013 and why uh, we're having this webinar so that thing doesn't happen at some of the district events, especially for the new teams. Sure. Um, teams, particularly rookie teams, tend to put off making the bumpers until the last minute because they're concentrating on their robot. Um, and then they sometimes show up at competitions with illegal bumpers. Uh, can't go on the field with it with illegal bumpers just not going to happen um, so you need to get on these fairly soon and keep an eye on the rules because rule updates issued by first HQ because things change from time to time uh, when we went to the inaugural Calgary event in 2013 uh, I was with my previous team I took a um, group of kids and that was they're going to be their sole role was to prepare bumpers there were three or four veteran teams at the event and all the rest of the teams were rookies and the, the my teams my bumper team spent a long time helping teams make bumpers because they just didn't have them the safety guys were not happy having us in the pit making bumpers they thought we'd expand it out of our pit area but we managed to convince them that we were doing it for any team that needed them and we were able to get all teams on the field to compete uh, which is everybody's goal. So the key here is read the instructions, bumper instructions very carefully. They're pretty explicit. Um, Paul's got them up now, or most of them up on screen. Um, and if you have any questions on them, please ask. Yeah, and, and part of it was that um, George mentioned to me this morning, because I really haven't had time to read the updates. Um, 
the third the second bullet point under bumpers here on the screen says Florida seven and a half inches above the floor is the bumper zone. Uh, and I mentioned that it was changed by update one because it was seven inches. So, so essentially what that means is, and we're not going to go through all the rules, but that's one of the reasons why we recommend reading the rules, is that you have to figure out where exactly you want to put your bumpers. Now, um, there's lots of reasons why you might want them higher or lower. In this game, you have to sort of figure that out. And you can, you know, if you're not a veteran team, you can contact some veteran teams and ask them some questions. They would be happy to help you. Um, and for sure, as you're going to see at the end, you could talk to one of the hubs or the online help desk, and they would give you some information on that too. So you know, we could reach out to your first senior mentor um, in the area or any veteran team, any mentor who's done this before would help you. Um, but just to go through a couple of the key points. If you now know your perimeter, um, and it, these are the, the perimeter, these are the maxes here that we see in, in rule, uh, robot rule 03. Uh, you can have um, your perimeter smaller than that mm -hmm. and shorter than the 55 inch height. Um, some teams definitely will do that, I would think. And it's, it's important to note that that excludes your bumpers. So, uh, often they say, you know, measure them and then with a piece of string or something like that so you can get an idea. Mm -hmm. But um, the bumpers go on after that. And, mm -hmm. you, and you need to read the rules carefully because one of the rules it talks about is how much outside your perimeter frame. So the perimeter frame is not the bumper. So please keep that in mind. So when you see that mm -hmm. term perimeter frame, those are not the bumpers. And certain bolt heads and, that, and fasteners and that sort of thing are allowed to stick out past that 33 by 28, but be very careful of that. Personally, I would not design a robot to be 33 inches by 28 inches because I'd rather be a half an inch under than an eighth of an inch over. So you may want to purposely design to be 32 and a half or something like that by 27 and a half. As I said, better to be a little bit small and a little bit big. And just so you know, as you're, if you're a new team, when you go to the event, you're going to get inspected. And one of the inspections is going to be the size of your robot. And if it's too big in any of these uh, th dimensions, you cannot compete until it's within those dimensions. And th that's not a flexible rule. That's a hard and fast rule. So please make sure that you're mm -hmm. reading the rules that you know that. Um, the other part of it, um, it doesn't really say it here. It might say later on, but certainly in the rules, is you need to have... Um, bumpers that are that either two sets of bumpers one is blue one is red or one set of bumpers where the fabric can be flipped over uh, to be red or blue depending on which alliance that you're on uh, and you will be on both alliances during a, uh, a competition absolutely for sure but regardless of whether it's one set of bumpers or two sets of bumpers one of the keys is sometimes there's not a lot of time between matches and the recommendation is that they're easily removable by two people in less than five minutes. So um, the fasteners, I think, that come with the new Anti-Mark chassis uh, over the last couple of years made that a little bit easier. But uh, you you want to make sure that you can do that. And that's why it's important uh, to start on that as soon as, as soon as you can. So one of the <clears> – <throat> this is a diagram that shows you um, one of the ways that you could connect. But it, more importantly, it shows you – um, um, the configuration inside of the bumper. So you have three quarter inch plywood, and again, um, the uh, they rec it's recommended to be plywood. Um, some uh, some of the rules and explains particle board just isn't strong enough. Mm -hmm. Inside of that, you have two stacked pool noodles, and it's uh, two and a half inch uh, nominal. Uh, essentially, uh, there. If you go and try to find these noodles, and you say, "Oh, it's a little bit under two and a half," that's fine. They're the, that's just that particular size. And then that is surrounded. Usually, uh, they're kept together by duct tape before you put the fabric around. But then there's fabric, a cloth mm. covering. Yeah, you the just rules be, used to be. Yeah, the you, rules used to be really explicit. No tape was involved. Yeah. But sometimes, yeah. The problem is you can't compress them to be. Like if mm -hmm. you put tape on it, it's just there to hold them while you wrap the stuff, and it's not there to 
um, compress them because that'll be a, that would be an issue. And because there are multiple kinds of pool noodles, you have a choice. Um, Canada, that's a little bit can be a little bit hard to find pool noodles at this time of the year. Um, but regardless, whether they're round or petal shaped or hex shaped, uh, you can use them. They can be hollow or not hollow. Um, but you cannot mix. You can't have uh, uh, round on one side, pedal on another side, hex on another side. They have to be all of the yeah. same. And you can't mix both ones with a hole without a hole. Yeah. The reason being is that they don't want you having bumpers that are softer on the top half than on the bottom half. So if a robot smacked into you, having variable density bumpers might encourage that robot that smacks into you to uh, flip. That's the reasoning behind it. Right. And then to go back up, as I started with the last bullet point, um, one of the keys is that they can't weigh more than 20 pounds. Now that it would be hard to make them more than 20 pounds, I think. Um, they just don't weigh that much, those those combinations. You well, know, some people feel that traction is equal, or weight is equal to traction, or relates uh, strongly to traction. So nothing says that that'll, that angle of the optional angle on the top has to be aluminum. Right. Um, if you really wanted to, you could use steel, which gives you more weight, but you know you're getting kind of picky there. Yeah. One thing I can suggest about mounting those bumpers, you can see in the example, it uses a bolt going through into a T-nut, which is pressed into, or some kind of, a, it's either a riv nut or a T-nut that's pressed into the, the wood of the bumper. If you're putting a T-nut on the inside of the bumper and then bolting through, I would suggest that you don't rely on the spurs on that T-nut to hold it into the wood. Put a wood screw in beside it, because if you do an oopsie and you push that T-nut in, so it falls out and it's inside your bumper. It's a lot of work opening up the bumper to put that T-nut back in place. So put a wood screw in or something in there to keep it in place so it can't fall out into the inside of your bumper. Uh, and that's a really good point because as you go through the rules, you'll notice, um, I hope you'll notice, um, that if your bumpers do come off in a match, your robot will get shut down in that match. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it does happen. I've, it happens every year. Um, and of course, Part of what you're going to do between matches is check your connections to make sure that they're they're solid, mm -hmm. and, and that might be why it's a good idea to have the same person or same two people looking after that, so they can make sure mm -hmm. that it's done exactly the same way. Um, in terms of the the weight, the 20 pounds weight, it sh it should be mentioned that when you have to bag and tag your robot, you do not have to put the bumpers in the bag. So, but they don't count as part of your 120 pounds for your robot. So um, the weight limitation the last couple of years has been 120 pounds, um, but that's excluding the bumpers and excluding the battery. So, you know, you want to keep that in mind. Uh, and the last point there is you have to have numbers on all four sides that it's recognizable. And you they don't have to be white. They don't have to be in a particular font. The year we didn't have uh, bumpers. Um, they could actually be uh, a piece of paper, an, uh, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and, and, um, and then they didn't have to be white, but they have to be white, or if you have a specific color you're doing, they have to have a white outline around the number. So you need to check the rules to make sure that that's clear. To go back to Paul's previous slide, you can see that bumpers don't have to be continuous all the way around the robot. You can have gaps. Uh, if you have have a gap, let's say, on the front of your robot, um, you, you're not supposed to put the full number on each side. You can put, as an example, 13 on one side of it and 60 on the other side. They just don't really want to avoid confusion in any way possible. But check over the diagrams. They're really explicit. You can see that they talk about the distances measured from the corner of the robot. If you have bolt heads, that are going to interfere with secure mounting of your of your um, bumpers, you may want to just drill a large hole partway into the plywood that sits over that bump, that bolt head, so yeah. that it makes them easier to secure. Yeah. And sometimes that takes a little bit more planning. It's a little bit easier to do that when you're not rushed to get it done. Uh, we mm -hmm. did have one quick question about, uh, maybe you've seen this, George, I've never seen this. Uh, what happens if your bumpers get destroyed during a match? I've never seen them get destroyed. I've seen them come off, 
come apart. But I've seen them get torn. Yeah. Uh, in which case, what they'll probably do is they will stick a piece of the appropriate colored gaffer tape or something like that over them. We haven't got to the material, the, the bumper fabric yet. I think that's just coming up, isn't it, Paul? Um, well, it is. Um, it's the last part here. It's, so the bumper fabric okay. is, uh, you don't have to have this fabric, uh, but it's a rugged fabric. And, and uh, that material is available through uh, Studica. It's a Andy Mark product. Nice part about it is it's in a long enough length that you can use it easily. And there's a minimum of cutting to get it to be the right uh, height. Mm -hmm. The length is, is another issue, but um, mm -hmm. that's going to depend on if you have that large gap, like, like George said. So there are some, some issues with that. You, you can also get bumper material. I bought it many times from a company called J. Ennis. Um, they're a Canadian company and they, they will ship to you and it comes in a big piece. It'll be you buy some, it'll last you a long time. And it's jnsfabrics.com. I'll post the link under the questions there so you can, question box so you can see it. Okay. There you so, go. So again, um, Studica has both materials and you can see it's even nicely gives you the dimensions, 161 inches by 19 and a half uh, inches high. So again, because it's it's got a wrap um, around and usually it gets um, connected through some kind of either staples or with some kind of fastener to so make sure it doesn't come apart. Um, again, the stick on numbers that are available from, from Studica are, are vinyl numbers that you would use with an, a heat press or an iron to put them on your mm -hmm. um, bumpers. Uh, it doesn't have to be that. They don't have to be stick-on numbers. Um, um, at the team I was with, 4001, they have a vinyl cutter, so they usually make them, and then we have a heat press that we put them on. Uh, but that's it can be tricky. But the, uh, the it, there's nothing that says they have to be stuck on. For example, there are teams that paint them on. You mm -hmm. just have to follow the rules. It, it would be, I guess, good to have a stencil. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys use in 1360, George? Um, recently, we've painted them on. Some teams go fancy and they use actual sale material. They, they go to a yacht supplier or a sail maker and they actually get the appropriate material. Um, some teams like to use a really slippery material, figuring that robots will, rather than being able to push them around, will slide off. Um, it's you know if, if it's slippery, it works both ways. If the people slide off you, you're going to slide off whoever you're trying to push if you're being playing defense. Mm -hmm. So uh, just uh, because I was getting ready for this, I decided to look up um, around me. I live in Newmarket um, where there might be, if there's poon noodles. Um, so the Newmarket Canadian Tire Store says they do have 68 of them. Um, but that could be any size, really. And the Richmond Hill Hunt had 90. George has found Pioneer Pools in Oakville. I know the Pioneer Pools that I use because um, I have a pool here in, in Newmarket, the store I use is also Pioneer Pools and they don't have any left. So um, hmm. you have you have to look around. Uh, it would be a good idea to find them as soon as you could. Yes. Before this uh, gets out and everybody's in your area looking for these pool noodles. But um, again, um, the sooner the better that you start on your bumpers that you can make changes to it and so forth. And once you get the hang of it, uh, they're not too tough. It's just under stress at the last second. It can be, it can be a struggle, for sure. Um, and again, we're we're pointing this out now, well in advance of the end of build, so that you can do it. You do not want to have back your robot and then say, oh, we got to build these um, pool these bumpers and find out that you're you're trying to get it to go. So mm -hmm. that's that's an issue. Okay, so that's our last word on bumpers, and George has already been introduced. So one of the areas that George and I are both involved in is, and as is every team and every mentor, is um, safety. So last two years ago, we started the safety badge program. It was actually started by teams 1241 and 1285 out of Rick Hansen School, and somehow it has evolved that um, I've taken it over. And there's an, uh, a picture of the badge. And so um, there is a bronze. There will be a silver this year. 
um, and you can get one, get a bronze badge at your event, your first event or your second event, depending when you do the quiz. Um, and uh, it's a fun quiz. You should know the rules. We always recommend read the rules, read the rules, read the rules. There are safety inspectors. There's safety people from UL at the events. And there's all sorts of important details about safety. Many of them are in there. There's in the uh, quiz. It doesn't cover every question. And even when you do the questions, you're only going to get 30 random questions out of the 120 some odd questions that I put in there. I think they're all correct. I've checked and double checked, but um, I'm getting kind of elderly, so I might have missed something. So if you do see one that's wrong, please don't hesitate to contact me. I will not be offended as long as you're um, pointing it out in a graciously professional way. Um, maybe, George, you can talk a little bit about the safety um, aspect of in your own shop and then um, at the events as well. Sure. Well, um, we have a safety, we have a team safety captain who's responsible for it. And because we have our own shop and it's a community team, we're responsible for our own safety. Um, no one from a board office is going to be coming in. We insist that every student member have um, green shield uh, safety footwear to be in the shop area. Um, we gave them a few days to get it. So as of last night, they don't have it. They're not coming in the shop. Um, we also use a safety passport program system where we have one made up and it uh, lists all the machines that we they might have use of uh, in the shop. And it uh, has two levels. It has exposure and proficiency. Uh, the exposure level, once you teach a lesson on a machine, um, they put down the date beside that. They initial it, you initial it, and so that everybody knows that they've been taught how to safely use that machine. Uh, once they're ready to use the machine, then they come and find a qualified instructor. And there are very few, we're limited to the number of people that can sign off. I'm going to quiz them on the rules on the machine, uh, make sure they know how to operate it safely. I'm going to watch them use it, and then we both initial off that they've achieved proficiency on that machine, which is then their license to use the machine. Um, I wouldn't, I would have a separate one for my room. When I was with a school-based team, we had a separate binder for them, even though they use them in the shop classes as well. Um, just better to have it. The safety judges love to see it. Um, and it, it's pretty easy to maintain. And also, if there is an accident in your shop and someone is hurt, then first of all, our insurance company be, is very happy to know that we have this in place so that we have some proof that we have safely instructed those kids how to use the machine if they happen to cut themselves. Uh, it happens. Um, then we can, it's, you know, there's, well, yes, we did teach him how to use it, and, but he chose to stick his finger into the blade anyway. Um, you're, there's some coverage there. So you may want to consider doing that. Again, we're all responsible for each other's safety. Every student and everybody, and no one should be afraid to speak up if they see something happening that is unsafe, both in your shop or at a competition. There are lots of people that don't work terribly safely. Um, one of the big issues you see is people standing on furniture um, to put up things in the pit, and um, safety guys don't like seeing that. No, and, and we have, uh, just as a aside, I was at the FLL East event this weekend and selling swag, as I always do. And um, they don't really use any tools, obviously, but there was one man, I mean, it was cold. This is Ontario in January, who was wearing... Uh, sandals with no socks, and I just, I was cold just looking at them. That um, is fine for FLL, but you cannot get into the pits or into someone's pit uh, with open-toed shoes, for example. That's no. one of the rules. Okay. And shorts are strongly discouraged. Yeah, and if you're there, it's your responsibility um, to point it out. Everybody's responsibility. There's lots of rules about that, as you will see. And, of course... You know, um, I would say part of what I've noticed that uh, is, it should needs to be cleaned up is load in and load out um, and how mm -hmm. teams are sometimes not as safe as they need to be. Mm -hmm. so, and, and again, it may not be your team, but that doesn't mean, I mean, it may be a rookie team, it may not even be a rookie team, but it may be a new student to that team, to that veteran team, and it needs to be pointed out. And of course, one of the key rules in the safety uh, manual is that uh, mentors need to be uh, examples of good safe practices. So that's something to keep in mind as well. 
there are safety awards at the events, which you can look at um, online, and then the safety manual gives you some more information about that. Mm -hmm. now, so, Paul, there's just been update number three has just come out, and there's a change to the bumper rules. Right now it says, must consist of Arabic numerals at least four inches tall, at least half inch in stroke width, and maybe either white in color or outlined in white with a minimum of one sixteenth inch outline. So they have to be Arabic numerals. So in, in case you don't know, that's the general numeral system that we use. So they can't mm -hmm. be Roman numerals, for example, I think is what they're, they might be yeah. talking about. So, um, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure why that would ever have been said before, but I'm sure something someone has asked about it, and that's why it's been been pointed out. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know. So keep reading the rules and keep re reading the updates. Um, the last thing we wanted to talk about today is is field elements. We had a call last night that George and I were on, I believe, um, with Frank Merrick, who was the designer of the game, who leads the game design. And one of the questions, one of the other first senior mentors asked about or pointed out was these things are enormous and it's very difficult and very expensive to build them out of wood and there has to be perhaps mm -hmm. an easier way to do that um, and so forth. But um, I've listed on the side here on the left some of the things that you could build. Um, I did a lot of this with the Team 4001 last week, um, but one of the ones I didn't build was the portal because um, in my opinion, the exchange had some of the similarities and um, based on what the team is planning to do with their robot, they just felt that it wasn't something that they would need necessarily, the, that they could mm -hmm. probably use the exchange as a, um, a replacement for that. But mm -hmm. I guess the key element, uh, the key question there, George, is the first one, why build field elements? Well, if you're, <coughs> theory's a nice place. I'd like to visit it sometime. Um, just because you're a robot, you think it can reach up to a height to put something on as an example of scale. Uh, you're going to want to test that and you're going to want to practice it. Not very many rookie teams have the uh, facilities or the strengths to be able to build two robots. Um, most veteran teams, I would say, now build a second robot that they use to practice with. Um, <coughs> and also to make modifications with so that they can put them on the robot at competition or in the unbagged time before a competition. Um, the drawings that FIRST provides, the team element drawings, are not very easy to follow in a lot of cases. They're a little bit, seem to be a little bit better this year, but there's nothing like having an actual version of the field element to work with. Um, great idea to share with another team. These things are massive, like that scale that Paul has up, that thing's over 14 feet end to end. Um, I don't intend to build all of it, all you really need to practice with is that arm and it doesn't even need to pivot. If you set it to the maximum height, then you're going to be able to put something on it, whether it's at the maximum height or the or the lower height with with, the, with weights on it. So, you know, eventually you can change it, fix it up so it pivots. I personally I don't think I'll bother making it pivot. Um, same thing with the switch. You don't need the inside part of the switch. All you really need is the fence to go around it. You can get fancy and build that switch if you want. You could just lay out mark on the floor. You could just make the frame of the fence. You know, take those drawings and adapt them. And I understand that Jason Brett in BC has made up a set of drawings that are simpler than the first ones and that they're available on Chief Delphi. I haven't had a chance to look for them yet, but that's what we were told last night. So you may want to have a look on Chief Delphi for simplified um, field elements. So these are all great points one of the ones that i would mention that correlates to our bumper rules is if you see the platform here um you want to make sure that your robot can get up there because whether you climb or not you're mm -hmm. going to get points for getting on there and if you don't have some way to test out to see that you can get up that angle and on top because maybe your bumpers are too low and they're in the way and they're not letting you do that um that's one of the things you want to to test. And that's mm -hmm. also another reason why you might want to build those bumpers. The other part of that too is if you do build the exchange or the portal and you're going to get um, stuff, uh, cues from the portal or push cues through the exchange, um, if you don't put your bumpers on, you may think it works, um, but it might not actually work when you, when you test it out. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why 
you want to have access to those. Now, if you can't make the field elements, you could um, find someone who's got them. Um, people will share, they're happy to share. Uh, but there are also um, practice sites. Um, there's one at, uh, there'll be one at Studica in Mississauga, one at John Polanyi, which is around Bathurst and Lawrence, Bathurst, uh, sorry, Lawrence and the Allen Expressway. I believe there will be one in Hamilton at the Robodrome mm -hmm. at St. Mary's. And I think uh, there's still one, uh, a partial field that will be at um, Vic Park, if I'm not mistaken. And there'll be, I'll have one as well that people are welcome to come and use. It'll just be a partial field. And that's the one thing. There will be lots of partial fields around. And, and uh, if, you, mm -hmm. if you get access to one, uh, you really... You want to take advantage to, to try it out and to test uh, at least that part of your robot. Yep. One thing you might want to notice as well from Paul's the drawing that Paul has up there right now are those pieces labeled cable protectors. That's in order to get power to the scale. And the as the rules update, one of the updates says that actually sticks up. It's a piece of con cable conduit, and it sticks up about seven eighths of an inch from the floor. So you're going to want to make sure that your robot can get over that. Uh, um, if you're going with the gearboxes provided with your kit of parts, you're probably okay. But uh, if you go with something like the EVO3 and you go with small wheels, it'd be really embarrassing to get hung up on that on that um, cable protector. Mm -hmm. All really good points. And just it will uh, be velcroed to the carpet. Yeah. Let's hope we don't have uh, game stop because it gets moved. Hopefully that's not going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. But you never know. Things happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. So one of the points I would make, the last point we're going to make tonight before we go, is uh, that there is lots of support available. There are lots of people who are brighter than, well, at least me. George is pretty sharp. Um, nah. That that can help you out and are, are, and would be happy to help you out. And one of the mm -hmm. best is the online help desk that's run by Team Eleven Fourteen. Uh, symbotics from St. Catharines from Governor Simcoe High School and they'll be happy to help you as will um, virtually any veteran team that you talk to. I've never heard of one that that wasn't. There's also the hubs uh, and all of this information is on the First Robotics Canada website. You can see it right there uh, firstroboticscanada.org and the hubs and online help desk is, uh, is on the same. You're welcome to get help and you can certainly contact us and we would be happy to help you if we know the answer, like in George's case, or in my case, find someone else that can help you that know, actually knows the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask. That's why we're here. And if, if we can help, need to come out, if, we, if you'd like us to come out and visit a rookie team, then speak up, please. Both Paul and I are usually pretty available and we can come and visit your team and troubleshoot and give you some suggestions. If you haven't yet met local teams or introduced yourself, if you have a local team, then that's something you should be doing and because they'll help you. you, know, you know, everybody will, if you haven't been to a competition before, that's what we pride ourselves on is helping other teams. Yeah, it's sort of, um, you, most rookies don't believe it. Uh, we keep saying it and we keep saying it, but it's uh, the gospel truth that people will help you. Um, but they need to know that you need help. Um, I sent an uh, a touching base email out a couple of days ago to rookie teams in Ontario and Saskatchewan. And by two days later, I had 38 emails back, back and forth with questions that they had that they hadn't asked. Um, and I think sometimes it's because they, they think someone's too busy to answer their questions. But trust me, uh, more teams are now setting up one of their students as a person to, to do that. I know there's one at 4001. I know there's one at uh, 2013, the Cyber Gnomes who are there and part of their job is to connect with teams and uh, provide them with some resources if they have some questions. So don't be shy. So here we have a question. George, how can, how can people contact us if they have a question? So okay. I'm not seeing the questions come up. Must I know. Be something special. I'm, I'm special, yeah. So. You can contact yeah. George and I at these emails, and I'll put this on the first Canada Facebook page <coughs> um, after this uh, 
uh, webinar. But uh, we all have They can that. phone me as well. If they need, if there's something to come across in the evening and they need to get a hold of me, I'm with my team just about every evening and all day Saturday, so feel free to call me, 289-838-6428. And it should be mentioned that uh, George's team, Team 1360, has also worked with many rookie teams to help them um, prepare videos to... Mm -hmm. to um, promote their team when they visit sponsors and thus to promote their team within inside their school community within their board with their feeder schools and so forth so it's a, a great thing they do and uh, they produce fantastic work for sure thank you I'm fortunate to have a very strong media media group it's run by a grade 11 girl so Hopefully next week we're going to have our um, special guest from the Windsor area, Monique um, Pouquet, um, who was a constant phone caller and emailer last year when she was a rookie. Yep. And which every time she had a question, she would ask. And if we didn't know the answers, mm -hmm. we would find someone that did. And I, I would like to think that part of that uh, is what led their team to be the rookie all-star team in Ontario last year and on their field at Worlds, they were also the rookie all-star. So um, <clears throat> part of that is because she kept, I mean, she, she's good. She kept asking questions. And one of the things that was interesting about her team was um, that she didn't feel like her best strength was the robot, but they had other tremendous strengths and they built on those. And now they're um, building great robots, but they're also... Um, a great team for uh, visuals and uh, outreach and getting involved in the community. And the same can be said of the team from St. Thomas 4525. They were exceptional with um, uh, their visuals, with the graphic design and so forth. And last year they had uh, a phenomenal robot too that did exceptionally well and they were our recent Chairman's Award winner. So, Work to your strength. Your robot doesn't have to be spectacular in your first year, um, so keep that in mind. Um, work to your strength. Oh, okay. So Asan is asking us questions. So it's Paul Keenan and George Chisholm. He wanted to know our full names. Okay. <clears throat> and there's a, a John and a Ringo involved in first as well. So just so we have the. Whole the whole Beatles thing covered. So Paul Keenan uh, and George Chisholm. And unless there are any more questions, we would like to thank you for joining us tonight. This will be mm -hmm. posted on the First Canada YouTube channel. <coughs> Excuse me. And we will also post the uh, link to the um, bronze safety quiz for 2018. And we'll post this. Uh, I'll put a link for these slides as well so you have access to these. So. Yep. Um, thanks for joining us. Have a great week. And bring building. on the questions. And bring on the questions, yes. And thanks again. So good night to everybody. Thank you, George. Good night. Thanks.